Welcome everyone to this podcast about domestic abuse. My name is Jarvis Conybert and I'm a site engineer from Western Rail interviewing Samantha Pierce. Um, Sam, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure, thanks Jarvis. Hello, uh, my name is Sam Pierce. I'm the Head of Employee Engagement here at Balfour Beatty and look after diversity and inclusion too. And I became involved in Balfour Beatty support for people experiencing domestic abuse a couple of years ago. I'm part of the working group that we have here. Brilliant. OK, um, so just to kick things off, why is raising awareness about domestic abuse so important? It, it is really important that we continue to raise awareness. There is quite a wall of silence around domestic abuse. Uh, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that I really didn't know the half of it until I got involved in the working group a couple of years ago. Um, so the more we're able to talk about it in Balfour Beatty, the more we'll be able to help our employees who may be experiencing abuse, because the numbers are quite terrifying, really. Um, 2.4 million adults affected by domestic abuse every year in the UK. Um, wow. And in fact, um, the police get a over 100 calls every hour. So I had no idea really of the scale of it myself. Um, and of course, it has got worse during lockdown, which I think most people have probably seen news articles about this but um, but there's no doubt that the demand for domestic abuse services really increased during lockdown um, both uh, women's charities men's advice lines um, and and really sadly in the first month of lockdown um, domestic abuse killings increased from an average of five a month to 16 in that first month so so during the pandemic it's worsened even more so really important to make sure that people in, in Balfour BT know a little about it and um, and are available to either help people or indeed if people in Balfour BT are experiencing abuse they know it's safe to, to come forward and, and talk about it and that somebody's there to listen. That's so important I completely agree and um, I'm not surprised sadly that the fact that we've all been shut indoors and, and and kept at home with potentially abusive partners has led to such a rise and it's so important that people educate themselves and learn about what they can do. Um, yeah, absolutely. So when people think about domestic abuse, um, it's often about violence, but are there other kinds of domestic abuse? There are actually, and I think that would have been my first thought was about um, a, a typical image almost in my mind of a man hitting a woman um, that that's what I kind of had in my mind as domestic abuse and, and of course power and control are at, at the heart of domestic abuse it is all about controlling um, and that can be physical but there are other kinds as well and and I think perhaps people don't necessarily even realize that they're maybe on the start of a of a domestic abuse situation because it's quite uh, quite hard to tell at the beginning but Different examples um, could be using coercion. So this is where somebody, your partner, is, is making threats towards you to maybe to hurt you or hurt your children, um, maybe to try and stop you leaving. Could be about using intimidation. And of course, this could be not actually violence, but um, threatening looks, threatening actions, or maybe just you know smashing things up or, or possibly even abusing um, your pets, so so being very intimidating and and um, and controlling you that way. It could be about emotional abuse, um, just that sort of belittling, uh, putting you down, calling you names. Um, and I think once somebody started down that journey, you you feel so insecure that it makes it even harder to to talk about it and to to break out of that situation. And and you you might have heard Jarvis of the, the term gaslighting, which comes from oh, a yeah. I think a 40s film, I think. It's definitely black and white. Um, and that's really about um, psychological abuse, people playing mind games, basically, you know, lying and making things up so that you as the victim feel you must be the one going crazy. You know, they could yeah, hide your keys or yeah. yeah, exactly. And and you just um as you start to to continue in that way, you you really start to believe that you're the one that's going mad, and that person who's abusing you is maybe your your protector almost and helping you out. Um, and then actually, one that um, that a, a colleague here at Balfour Beatty's talked about quite a bit is economic abuse. Um, either people yeah. being maybe prevented from getting a job or keeping a job, or just um, you know racking up debt in your name, putting your name on loans, and then getting you into debt which of course makes it hard again if you want to leave, um, it's hard to do so. 
Um, and then the last one I'd mention is is isolation. Um, and that's again where that, that quite clever psychological behavior where you're prevented from um, seeing people, you know, starting to, you're, you're, the perpetrator starting to, um, to get between you and your family or your friends by just making comments, um, observations where you start to doubt that they are the people that you should be spending time with. And, and actually, when we're thinking about raising awareness at work, for some people, work might be the only place they do go and see other people because some of those other relationships are broken down. So it's, you know, really wide ranging. Yeah, that's so that's so informative. Like, it, like you say, sometimes you just think maybe a man hitting a woman. Yeah. Um, and that's what domestic abuse is. But you've obviously gone into it there. There's so many other different forms. It's so important that people know about them. Um, yeah. And on the subject of men and women, um, would you say abuse is usually directed from men to women or are there other avenues? Well, it, it is the most common. And um, we, when we talk about domestic abuse in Balfabiti, we do always talk about abuse against anybody, regardless of gender, because absolutely anybody can suffer from domestic abuse, regardless of their gender, of their age, or, you know, even of their, their job. Um, you mm. could be a, a, a very uh, senior person in an organisation, a, a, a politician, a celebrity. Um, you could have any type of job at all. You know, it's not specific to any type of role or gender, but it is undoubtedly much more common for abuse to be from men to women. Um, but yeah, absolutely, there there may be abuse from women to men in a relationship, and of course between same sex couples as well. Um, in terms of the numbers, it's about one in four women and one in six men will experience abuse in their lifetimes. And, and that number kind of really comes home to you when at the moment we think about the rule of six a lot, don't we, as to how many friends we can see at any one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you think about it in that context, those five people you'll be with, you know, one of them may be or has or will experience abuse. So it, it does bring it home when you think about it in those kind of numbers. And But yeah, there's absolutely can affect anyone. And there's lots of different charities out there for different groups of people. So uh, we've been talking to an organisation called the Mankind Initiative. Um, obviously, we have a lot of men working in Balfour Beatty, and the yeah, chances yeah. are there are a lot of men who are experiencing abuse. And, and they tell us that men are even less likely to speak up than women. It's going to be hard for anybody, but um, but yeah, men even less likely to, to speak up about abuse. So we, we do need to be aware and, and look out for people. Yeah, of course, we definitely do. I completely agree. Um, from a Balfour Beatty perspective, um, what are Balfour Beatty doing to support people experiencing domestic abuse? Well, I'm really pleased to say that we we sort of signed up to, to supporting in 2019. So the good thing was we, we already had some knowledge and we had a lot of resources available before the pandemic started which made it much easier for us to, to share those and reach out and help people. And we'd already raised awareness quite a lot. Um, it started in 2019 when we, we signed the Employers Initiative on Domestic Abuse, <laughs> which is a bit of a mouthful, um, yeah, and their yeah. membership charter that enabled us to access all of their expertise and resources. Um, and right. that was when we set up the working group. And it, it actually came about from one of our colleagues, uh, Natalie. And Natalie really wanted to be on the podcast today and, and talk a bit more about her story. But unfortunately, she's not well. Um, but okay. Natalie came to us a couple of years ago um, because she herself was a victim of domestic abuse. Uh, and in her words, you know, she said she went from being really happy and confident and outgoing into a complete recluse uh, and someone who loved their work and thought they were doing a great job to someone who really just couldn't function at all in the workplace. Um, and she said she felt so ashamed about her situation and really embarrassed. She didn't think she could tell anybody, but she just hadn't got a clue what support was out there. And, and in her words, you know, the support that's out there is life changing. And I'm pleased, delighted to say that Natalie's life for anyone who knows her has, has changed for the better. Um, so, so she was really committed to making sure that everybody um, had access to this support. So that's why we we set up our, our group. We've got um, SharePoint page, which has loads of resources uh, and guidance, both for individuals, but also for line managers, because 
We know that victims are, are more likely to talk to friends, but they are actually likely to talk to line managers about this, possibly because it does affect performance so much. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there's loads of resources on there. Um, and the next step, which was great, was earlier this year, um, we worked with a charity called Hestia, um, who support domestic abuse, and they trained 14 of us, myself included, um, to become allies against domestic abuse. So we've received training to um, be able to, to support a little bit more in Balfour BT. Um, but, you know, nobody, nobody needs to be an expert um, just uh, for line managers particularly, just feel able to listen and know where to signpost people, really, because we've got all those resources there now. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. That's really, really good to know that you work for a company that's so mm -hmm. has such a concern regarding yeah. domestic abuse and has so much available to anybody um, in terms of support. So um, yeah. I would definitely advise people to look into becoming an ally as well as yeah. uh, sharing that information with any colleagues. Um, so if we go back onto sort of the topic of domestic abuse itself, Mm -hmm. um, what, are the, what are the signs that we should look out for in our colleagues or friends and family? Well, it, it is important to uh, to not jump to conclusions, I guess. Um, but there are signs that if you see repeatedly, you, you might want to check in on somebody. Um, it's we, we have talked a lot because we had so many people working from home about the fact that if people don't turn on their cameras, that is a sign. Equally, it's a sign that they maybe have a really messy house that day or a child running around. <laughs> but it, it is a sign, possibly, that they, they don't want um, their, uh, their partner to see um, the call or for people to see their partner maybe being in the room. So, so when people are working from home, it, it is things like that. It's maybe partners being visible or maybe your colleagues seeming a bit wary or a bit tense on the call. Um, or possibly if meetings aren't essential, they, they might withdraw more from those sort of informal catch ups and, you know, well-being type chats that we had quite a lot of um, while a lot of people were working from home. So so there are a few of the, the signs working from home. Um, but then when you look in the workplace, I particularly this is, you know, for line managers, but also for colleagues, uh, increased absence or, or lateness together. Also the opposite, somebody who never takes sick leave, never takes their annual leave, always wants to work late or put in extra time. That that might be because they want to stay away from home because work is a safer place. Um, you, you might see changes in behaviour. People might appear more anxious. Um, you might see things like changes in clothing. You know, somebody might be trying to cover a bruise, so they might wear something, you know, right up to their, their chin on a maybe a day when it's a bit too hot for that type of clothing, for example. So, um, yeah. so that's sort of some of the signs. And, and because it, you know, people are quite often targeted at work, um, which, which must be so hard to work uh, and, and be bombarded with text messages or phone calls or somebody trying to keep a track of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so you, you might notice that, you know, somebody constantly looking at their phone in a meeting. It might not be that they're rude or that they're more interested in a in an app. It, it might be that they're worried that they're having to reply back to somebody who is definitely wanting to know where they are or what they're doing. And I think what I would say, particularly for, for line managers, um, and we've talked about this quite a lot in the working group where we have some line managers, is if you do see a dip in performance, Obviously, it could be one of many, many things, but um, as with any performance conversation, it's it's important not to just focus on the task, but to try and understand the underlying problem, because it could be that domestic abuse is something that is causing a performance dip, although obviously it could be many other things too. So so there's some of the, the things that you might spot. Yes, I think, yeah, like you say, a change in performance or a change in personality usually is a, is a link to something like domestic abuse potentially being there or yeah, another effect yeah. on their mental health. It's so important. What you were just saying um, actually reminded me of an example, which I thought was really good to share. Uh -huh. um, and I, um, I heard about a GP practice. Um, yeah. So uh, when ladies were asked to go to the, to the toilet to provide a sample, they provided two different coloured pens to write their name on. Um, yes. So when they handed the sample back, if they wrote in the black pen, they were fine. If they wrote in the red pen, there was a domestic abuse situation or something that they wanted to discuss privately with the doctor. So when yeah. they had the sample in, 
the receptionist or whoever took the sample, the nurse, um, would then see the colour of pen and then specifically then ask the partner to leave the room. And obviously in that situation, that that can be awkward for the, the abusive partner and then they can leave and then that provides potentially the only sort yeah. of environment that somebody could really open up and really feel safe. So I thought that was yeah. a really, really good way of supporting it. And um, yes. I know there are, there are different ways to apply it in the workplace, but um, that was quite a good example, I thought. It's, yeah, no, it's a great example. And, and there are a number of initiatives that you, you, you see or you hear of where um, people are able to use code words or something like that, writing in a different colour pen, just to raise awareness. And, and there, there's quite a lot on YouTube and, and, and television adverts as well, whereas the you know hand gestures, etc., that you could, yeah. you could use to show that you're you're, you're feeling um, threatened or you're you're possibly in danger. So yeah, that's a that's a great example, and and it's it's just um, it raises that that um, reminder really that. For some people, there just isn't a safe space to to get out and tell somebody that you're you're in danger or that you're um, you're experiencing this abuse. So yeah, it's a good example, Jarvis. So um, as an employee of Balfour Beatty, um, how can I and how can we offer support? What sh what kind of things should we say? What kind of things should we do? Well, I think. Um, the first thing that, that people probably want is somebody to firstly believe them because I you know I, I can think of, of people who you you just were if they said they were experiencing abuse you just would think goodness a it's been really well hidden or maybe b oh but I've met your partner and they seem really lovely um, and of course the most important thing is to believe the person that's telling you that there is a, an abusive situation and and listen and, and not offer any blame um, I think in that conversation, it is much more about listening than anything else. Somebody who reaches out to you doesn't necessarily suddenly want to leave or take action or call the police. They might just want someone to, to listen to them or uh, give them some, some um, support and, and care, really. So listening is important. Letting that person set the pace at which they want to move forward um, we've got lots of resources, so nobody needs to be an expert. As I say, it's more about making sure that you've, um, you've, you're very clued up as to where those resources are and signposting somebody to them. And I think you just ask the question, how can I support you? Um, and, and let them take the lead really on, on what they want or need. And as I say, it might just be that they're looking for someone to, to listen, they just need to reach out. It might be that there are just some, some practical steps. Like I say, they might not want to take action particularly against the abuser, and it's certainly not our role to do that, but they might, um, they might um, appreciate a safe space to make a phone call to, uh, as we've said, you know, safe spaces are hard. So make yeah. a phone call to a lawyer or, or to a specialist service. It might be as simple as they, you know, they have a long walk to get to their car and they're nervous about that. Could we offer them a, a parking space nearer the building? Um, you know, little little things that seem quite little, but um, it, it might be that that's all that they want at that moment in time. Um, so so that's that's the sort of thing that we can just ask what would help you? Um, of course, the other thing is people may not ask for help. Um, and and you don't want to make any assumptions and it's difficult. But I think if you can see potential signs, as we just talked about, um, you don't even need to mention domestic abuse. You can just ask any of your colleagues who who are showing signs of maybe being unhappy or anxious um, or maybe they've been absent. You know, you seem distracted. You seem upset. Are you OK? You know, I'm here to talk if if um, if you want to chat to somebody, I can always listen. So I think we can ask that sort of question uh, without making assumptions and just let people know that we're there for them. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's completely right. Um, especially some things like you say that you might think are minor, like having a new parking space, they can make yeah. such a difference yeah. for people. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's so important, do the minor things, do the major things, but mainly just listen and just just be there for those kind of people who are experiencing things like that it's so important absolutely um, so um so where where can people go for help 
Well, we, like I say, we signpost people to the specialist helplines. The, the National Domestic Abuse Helpline is open 24 hours, so that's obviously a good place to start. But yeah. on our SharePoint pages, we do show them, uh, show people all of the, the range. Like I mentioned, Mankind is, is specifically for, for male victims, for example. Um, we always recommend the Bright Sky app. Now, I, I don't know if you've seen this, Jarvis, but this is a really clever app. It was developed by Hestia, the charity I mentioned earlier, and Vodafone. <laughs> And yeah. it looks like a weather app and it works like a weather app. You know, you can find your weather in whatever location you choose, but okay. um, you can also click through and you will get to domestic abuse help, um, whether you're looking for yourself or whether you're looking for someone else. Um, so I would recommend everyone downloads that. Just have it on your phone as one of the other many apps you probably have, because you just never know when you might need it, you know, when that one in four or one in six person may obviously need some help. And, and if you've got that, that's right there in the palm of your hand um, to, to give support. So, so I think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. we've said in, in the workplace, um, we're able to offer that safe space for calls to be made. Um, but also pharmacies are offering that now. Um, UK Says No More was a campaign that started in lockdown um, simply because people were trapped at home. So it gave people an opportunity to, to get a space to make a phone call. And a, a more recent initiative is called Ask for Annie, uh, which is actually standing for action needed immediately. So if you walk into any pharmacy and say, can I speak to Annie? then they'll make sure you get immediate assistance because that means your, your life is in danger at that point. So there, there's lots of options for people when they're, they're ready to look for some support. It does sound like there's so many and, and that weather app as well just sounds really clever. Really um, clever. So, yeah. so definitely it's definitely worth promoting those and people can go to the SharePoint pages for all that information which is great. Yeah um, it's all so there. It's a good, that's a good place to start. So while you're talking about um, Ask for Annie, um, I understand recently as well there was a domestic abuse bill that had been passed so that must be good news. Yeah absolutely um, Natalie did post on it um, on Yammer recently but for anyone who's not seen that or seen it in the press um, it is long overdue but um, but the Domestic Abuse Act has now um, uh, been passed. It's, it's giving um, new protection which is great so for those experiencing abuse when they're in court they, they have more protection now and it gives police new powers too so that they can give immediate protection to people um, and, and actually the, there's now a proper legal definition which um, there wasn't and this goes way beyond the physical violence so all those things I talked about earlier you know, emotional, um, financial abuse and so on they're all now part of this act so it does mean that perpetrators can be tackled uh, more easily because there's a, a much better legal definition um, and it actually um, following a lot of campaigning by um, charities like Refuge has had new offences added um, so things like non-fatal strangulation um, or even just threatening to disclose intimate images is now all covered by this act so oh, it's wow. more wide-ranging uh, and therefore just giving much more protection so the, yeah, many cheers the day that that was passed at the end of April, I think. Yeah, I, I can imagine so. I think, yeah, just like you say, with all those new things that are now covered, um, I think that people are going to have a bit more confidence to come out and, and, and yes. get, get, the, get the abuse to, to end. And I think yeah. it's, so, it's so good that we've now got that passed in law. Um, so um, we're coming towards the end Sam, thank you so much for your time. It's been really good to learn You're from you. You're very welcome. And I hope everybody listening will also have learned a lot today. Um, do you have any final thoughts at all? Um, I'd just like to say um, that, that this and, and all of the other awareness that we, we try and raise is really just to make sure we can reach out to people. Uh, when we started this, this journey to giving better support two years ago, uh, we had a lot of people come forward and tell their stories, which was extremely emotional i think jarvis the most emotional webinar i've ever done was to to mm -hmm. hear or read in in the comments the stories that people in balfour Beatty, people we sit next to potentially um yeah. are, are talking about in terms of their experiences and there are probably people out there who are suffering now who haven't reached out so so just final word for me is just um to reach out uh, whatever gender you are reach out um either to to myself you know one of the other 14 trained allies but equally to a to a colleague or a line manager because um you you need to know that you're not alone there is somebody there that can help and that can listen 
Thank you so much, Sam. Um, it's been a really informative half an hour with you. And um, again, I hope everybody on the on the call listening has had a good opportunity to learn from Sam and everything she's had to say, and that you now go and have a look at the SharePoint page, have a look at the links, download the Hestia Weather app, mm -hmm. um, and start to become an ally for people suffering and provide the opportunity for them to come and speak out and and put a stop to whatever they're going through. So thank you again, Sam. Um, that's all from me. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Jarvis, and have a great rest of the day. You too. Bye. Bye.